looks like we're ahead of schedule and on budget. All right. Um, okay, well, uh, as builders, I'm sure that many of you work with structural engineers every day or the work that they do. So I thought what I'd do today is take away some of the mystery of what structural engineers do. Now, um, structural engineers actually have um, five years of college, typically five years of college, five years of experience, and then they take four day-long tests. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover that material in the next 19 minutes. <laughs> We're always dealing with gravity. Gravity is ever-present. Every one of our structures, we're always dealing with gravity. Um, structural engineers are thinking about that constantly. And um, if you look at what gravity means, gravity is actually potential energy. And it just takes a little bit of an event to actually release that potential energy. No one was hurt. No one was hurt. But it demonstrates how when you have mass at height, there's energy there. And sometimes a little initiating event can cause a massive situation. Now, um, we take advantage of that when we're trying to demolish a building through building implosions. A small amount of explosives will actually bring down the whole building. And it's because there's stored potential energy and gravity. So by definition, in order to build a building, you have to overcome gravity to get that mass up at height. So in some of our international work, uh, you can actually see the different techniques that they use to overcome gravity. Um, this is teamwork. Now, uh, you know, it's not, not all, this isn't really one of our international projects, but not some places they have better equipment, in some places they actually have the uh, ready mix truck, and then they have uh, equipment called a bucket, and they toss the bucket up to place for the concrete placement. So there's different things that are done to overcome gravity. Now, the other thing that we're dealing with always are earthquakes. And earthquakes, they're an occasional event, but they're a severe event. And when you look at Kobe, Japan, and you can understand the force of an earthquake, um, it's not just the structures. It's also landform. Strange things happen to the land. It may be a crack in the ground. It may be vertical displacement. Our uh, director of earthquake engineering, John Hooper, he took this picture at a high school in Taiwan. And then there may be horizontal displacement, like this from New Zealand. And your building may be strong enough. It may be strong enough, but if the soil liquefies, you can lose the whole building. Um, one of the most powerful, significant hazards of an earthquake in certain zones is tsunami. And you can see the power that can happen. And it is probably more of a threat to life in these zones than the earthquake itself. So um, wind. We have earthquake. We have wind. Those are the two natural hazards in addition to gravity. Wind, it's an incredibly powerful force. And you look at, in urban areas, the buildings that are in, a, in an urban area actually can magnify and amplify the wind. Uh, this was actually out in the north end of Seattle this last summer. Any of you remember the big windstorm? Um, this was some of that. And in fact, up in Bothell, you see some of these substantial, substantial trees that you'd think, well, but it's the power of the wind. And that's what uh, we're dealing with. So. Um, Structural engineers are dealing with all these things all the time, and I like to call this the good fight. We're always fighting gravity, wind, and earthquake. And so how do we go about assessing and accounting for these risks? Well, first thing we have to have is data. And um, if you look at a building, a typical building, and if you were to take and plot the height of the building versus, a, this is, happens to be for structural steel buildings, versus the pounds per square foot required in the structural frame, you'd get a graph like this. Then you could say, OK, there's some kind of an average line that goes through that data. And then if you strip away all the data, then you can see, OK, here's the underlying trend. And what is the trend line? As you go to increasing height, the amount of material per square foot goes sharply to the right, sharply increasing quantities. It's not a linear function. So why is that? Um, there's three components that make up the material that go into a building. Uh, stacking, 
and uh, lateral forces and floors. Now the easiest one of that, the floors, is simply, here's a floor from 2 Union Square in downtown Seattle. Um, the amount of steel required in that floor depends on the load on the floor and the span and nothing else. The 56th floor of 2 Union Square is exactly the same weight as the second floor in terms of the floor itself. So it's completely linear. There's no variation based on height. So when you look at this graph and this line right here, the projector is kind of washed out, but that line right there, floors is uniform, pounds per square foot, independent of height. The next item, stacking, it leans off a little to the right. And the stacking premium is just a fancy term for if you've got a multi-story building and if you look at the first floor, first frame floor, the weight of that floor has to be carried down one story. The top floor, the weight of that floor to get to the foundation has to be carried down seven stories. So if you look at all the floors in the building and look at the aggregate of all that, the columns down in the bottom, in the first story, there's seven times as much load on those as there's in the top. So as a building gets taller, the total amount of material devoted to columns increases linearly. So when you go back to this graph and you see the stacking premium, there's a floors, which is uniform, stacking, which is linear, and then the material required for wind and earthquake, which is bending sharply over to the right. It's some kind of an exponential curve. So to evaluate that lateral force, this is what engineers use to figure out what the risk is. This happens to be a map of the wind and earthquake risk all put on one composite map. So the, the pink areas here, those are contours of wind speed. And so you see the storms generate out over the oceans and then they hit land. And so the main wind risks are along the coasts. Makes sense. Uh, on the landforms, you can see all of these different uh, colors here. You can see you know, the ring of fire of which we're sitting right there on the ring of fire. That's how we look at earthquake risk. And so you see it, earthquake risk is all over, but in very specific areas. A little closer to home, if you were to look at the state of Washington, Olympic Peninsula, there's areas on the Olymp Olympic Peninsula that ha will have six times the earthquake risk of Spokane. Six times more hazardous. So a building in Spokane and a building in the Puget Sound area will be designed very differently. If you get even closer to where we are now, here's the Seattle area. And even within the Seattle city limits, there's a factor of two difference in earthquake risk depending on where you are and what your site is. So we take all this into account as we're generating our, our earthquake information. Now for wind, we look at wind history and wind probabilities. This is called a wind rose. It's just a graph that, it's a compass. So you see there's north and west, east, and south. The compass is telling, if you, as you look at these different contours here, the farther the contour is from the center of that little compass point, that represents increasing wind speed probability. So it's higher wind speeds the farther you are from the center. So as many of you know, in the Seattle area, our strongest winds on an annual basis when we get storms are from the southwest. And you can just see it right on a wind rose. If you look at the northwest, oops, if you look at the northwest, it's actually almost half the risk of having winds coming from that direction. So if you look at a building in downtown Seattle that's been designed in a wind tunnel, it actually has a stronger lateral system to resist winds from the southwest than it does from, say, the northwest. Because we want to take that into account. We don't want to waste material. So once you have just the basic floors and the basic columns, now you have to introduce this wind and earthquake hazard. What do you do about it? Uh, if you don't do anything, it, that would just shear. There's nothing there for lateral resistance. So there's three different types of systems. And basically, these are used over and over and over again by structural engineers. 
shear walls, brace frames, and moment resisting frames. So shear walls, probably the most common type of lateral system in the Northwest. Uh, and typically concrete. Even if it's a steel building, a lot of times the shear walls are concrete. And um, you look at how it works. You take that gravity system and you put some walls in it. And through the bending and shear resistance of those walls, that's what keeps those floors from being able to move side to side. The other, brace frames. And this is primarily steel brace frames, primarily steel structures but that's where you actually put diagonals in. It's pretty straightforward, pretty intuitive. You have your gravity system and you add the bracing and that's what provides the resistance for the building. The final one, the, the moment resisting frames, I actually had to go way back in our archives to find a picture of a, of a big size moment resisting frame, steel frame, and um, this happens to be the tallest uh, moment resisting frame in the Northwest. Uh, any of you know what that one is? It's Safeco Plaza. That's good. I wish I had the, like a candy bar or something to give to you. Um, it's Safeco Plaza, and it's a moment-resisting frame. It was built, I think, in 1969. So that tells you how the moment frames have kind of fallen out of favor, mainly because they take more material. They move more in wind and earthquakes, and so all your curtain wall detailing and all of that, it's much more difficult to have an overall system. So a uh, moment frame, it's simply you take the beams and columns, and you can barely see it, but the beams just got much deeper, the columns got deeper. There was field welding all over for all the connections in order to make a rigid grid to make the resistance for the building. <clears throat> now, there's a couple of buildings that we've been doing lately where we're combining systems. And so, like Russell Financial has brace frames and concrete. So you're going to probably be seeing, there's some very special reasons we were doing that, but you'll probably be seeing more in the next few years of different kinds of hybrid systems where we're trying to combine these for special reasons. And then you get a very interesting structural system. So, shear walls, brace frames, moment resisting frames, that's it. You now have your bachelor's degree in civil engineering. <laughs> um, but now it's time for your master's degree. <laughs> so I'm going to finish with three advanced topics. The first one is damping systems. Well, what is that? Okay. Um, probably best to show an example. We did this building in Hong Kong. This is on a Hong Kong island. It's a 73-story building, 50 feet wide in typhoon country. Um, the view from the top out over Hong Kong Harbor and Kowloon is spectacular. Um, the controlling factor for the structural engineer, we needed to restrict the wind motion during typhoons because people live in this building and they can't leave and go home when there's a windstorm. They are home when there's a windstorm. So in Hong Kong, the building code requires that you put fire water storage tanks at the top of your building. And we thought, well, wait, we could use those water tanks for reducing the motion of the building. And the way it works is that if you take a tank of water and you move it back and forth like it would in a building, the water levels go like this, back and forth, in tune to the period of vibration of the building. And so if you freeze that for a second and look at it at any point in time, if the building is moving this way, the water is higher on that side of the tank than on this side of the tank. So that means there's a net force of water pushing against the side of the tank, opposite the direction of building motion. When the building then goes all the way over to this side and then it starts coming back, the water turns and it is still pushing against the direction of building motion because the water just is always opposite the building motion. That's a form of damping, reducing the, the the motion by putting a restoring force. So I did this little demonstration, and these are two identical high-rise buildings. We'll call them high-rise buildings. And I put the secret ingredient in the tank on one of the buildings only, uh, fire water. No, that's gin, isn't it? No. And you can see just the water damped out the motion of the building. Now, just so you know, there's no tricks up my sleeve or anything like that.
And that's actually a more um, um, dramatic test because when you have a building, you don't push it all the way to the side and let go. It builds up slowly. The damping makes it so it never builds up. So it's actually a really cool thing, and it's, it's a more sophisticated way rather than the brute force of more concrete and more steel. So we use the exact same principle of damping in a very different way for the roof of Safeco Field. If you look at the roof, it has a center panel with four trusses, and they're all upturned above the roof plane. It has two side panels, each with two roof trusses, turned down below the roof plane. And looking at one of those upturned trusses, it looks like this in elevation. And if you look right here where I've got that white circle, I'm pointing at a joint. That particular joint is actually a hinge. And so you've got the roof truss, and this leg over on this side, it is hinged so that it could actually do this. Uh, we don't want it to do this. So what we actually do is we take these devices, which are dampers. They're 22 feet long, 18 inches in diameter. Cost At the time, they cost $83,000 a piece. And there's eight of them, one for each truss. And we put them into this location. That picture is right here, from there to there. So it completes the truss wrapping around the hinge. And so when the hinge tries to move, it needs to compress or stretch this member right here. That's the damper. So the damper looks like this. It's a cylinder with a piston inside. The cylinder is filled with silicon fluid. And the piston has some small holes in it. So when you try to push and pull, the silicon is forced from one side of the piston to the other through these little tiny holes. Well, that actually, it's viscous, and so it goes very slowly, and it heats it up. And so what this device does is it takes the kinetic energy of the building, the motion energy of the building, and converts it to heat. So in engineering, well, let me show you first. Um, this is the same place. The downturn trusses, we have a hinge right here. You see the gap? And then that leg, that's one, engineers would call that a free body. And we close that gap with a damper right here. So both of them are doing the same thing. They just look a little different. They both have hinges and legs that do this. And the damper resists that motion. So uh, from an engineering standpoint, when an earthquake hits, it's putting energy into your building. And for a graph, if you were to take time of the earthquake in seconds, so this is 24 seconds of earthquake. This is totally ener energy input. The top line represents the total energy that the earthquake's putting into the building. Now, normally in a building, there's three places where energy can go. The spring energy, which is a distortion of the structural frame, you know, actually bending it, that's energy. Motion, when it's moving, that's kinetic energy. The third place where the energy can go is damage. We really don't like any of those. <laughs> And so when we put the damper in, we're putting in a fourth place for the energy to go. And if you look at this colored diagram here, the blue and the red represent the, the, earthquake, the part of the earthquake energy that's gone into the spring and kinetic. The green represents the amount of earthquake energy that's gone into the damper. So what we've done is we put a huge reservoir to take earthquake energy so that the red and the blue get smaller and smaller and instead of getting bigger. So that means that the motion and the, and the distortion is less. And hopefully, it doesn't do any damage at all because we don't need to, to shed excess energy into, into damage. Um, this one's really hard to see. But it's not just stadiums. This is a two-story industrial building. The top one um, has conventional brace frames. The bottom one actually has damper brace frames. And the motion of the top one is about double the motion of the lower one. And therefore, the forces are about double in the top one. So many times, damping systems are good business, just simply good business. Certainly on Safeco Field, it, it was all about uh, good business. So um, instead of trying to absorb the energy with damping systems, another approach is to try to sidestep the energy. Uh, we did this in 
the uh, CenturyLink Safeco Field, or Safeco, Seahawks Stadium. And the big roof trusses of Seahawks Stadium, they go through this concrete pier. Uh, there's actually a slot that those trusses fit into. So if you look at this very closely, there's a steel truss coming in. There's a concrete ear here. But if you were to, through the magic of computer imaging, to be able to see through that concrete, you'd see that the steel comes down and it's shaped like this. And then there's something sitting right there that all of the load of the truss is coming down onto. Well, larger scale, there it is. And the entire weight of the truss is sitting on that. And it looks like this. It's a concave surface. So what happens is when the earthquake hits, there is no actual physical linkage for that pier, which is starting to move, to pull the roof with it. The roof will stay where it is. And this, it's concave, so it kind of the roof kind of rides up and down. But we're not trying to pull the roof. We're trying to leave the roof alone. So once again, if you look at a computer animation, this one we have the roof um, connected to the pier. This one we have it isolated. These are the same properties, same masses, same ground motion. And if you look at how much the one that's connected versus the one that's isolated, how much demand there is on the pier, you can equate demand to rebar, concrete, foundation loads. And so the one on the, on the far left is actually much more expensive than the isolation system. In the isolation system, the cost of the bearings compared to the cost of concrete and steel and foundations it's, it's a really good deal. So next time you drive by the football stadium and you look out there, just remember, in an earthquake, those are actually floating. They're, not, they're supported, but they're not, they're not hooked to the structure. A little scary. <clears throat> OK, and so my final topic, I call this art and advanced geometry. So what do I mean by this? Um, there's an architect in Chicago named John Ronan. And he's a, a practicing architect and a professor. And his statement was, the problem for today's architect is, what do you do when you can do anything? Because the tools that we have now, the computers, you can do anything. You can model anything. Uh, things that people didn't even dare dream of even 20 years ago, now it's being turned out all the way. Well, I don't think this is the problem. I don't think this is the problem. I think this is the opportunity. I think that the problem is, the problem for today's builders and engineers is, what do you do when an architect can do anything? <laughs> That's the problem. And um, I actually, uh, and I, I, I embrace the problem. And the secret is to collaborate, to collaborate, to bring the builders in early. Day one, if we can, if the owner will let us pick a, pick a builder. Because that's the way you can do things that, you, that an architect and engineers working in isolation couldn't do. Um, an example, there's a little technology company that's building a project in downtown Seattle. Some of you may know about it. I'm not sure how much I can talk about this, but I am. <laughs> and there, the centerpiece is going to be some spheres, uh, some glass and steel spheres. Uh, to give you an idea of scale, the center one is 130 feet in diameter. I think this one is 100 feet, and this one's 85 feet. Um, so they're large. Inside, there's some meeting spaces, a cafe, and lots and lots of plants. So it's going to be really cool. Um, but you look at it, and you go, wow, how do you build this? It's, it looks almost random and organic. And is it, do you just, is it just one big custom piece of art? Well, the answer is, it may look random and organic, but the reality is, if you think about the way a soccer ball is constructed, a soccer ball has basically two shapes, two patterns. One, pentagon, and the other is this six-sided thing that fills in in between the pentagons. So a soccer ball is round, and it's made of only two patterns, two pieces, repeated over and over. Well, we didn't even want two. We wanted one. So what we wanted was a soccer ball made of pentagons that had um, identical pentagons. So this is, I'm not going to even name the mathematical shape that this is. But this is a, a pentagon developed sphere. For the whole sphere, there's 60 identical pentagons. And that's the whole thing that makes up the circle, or the sphere. 
And um, if you look at that and think, okay, well, if we take this kind of mathematics to get maximum repetition, and we say, what if we're sitting there with these soccer balls uh, made up of pentagons? Um, if you say that that's the organizing element, then within, the, within that pentagon, you can do whatever you want and just repeat it. And as long as you touch the five corners so that you can make connections to the other pentagons. So in fact, the architects, they experimented with what they wanted to put inside their pentagons. Lots and lots of experiments. It was an incredible creative process. And the final pentagon that was picked, which I have right here, um, was actually picked collaboratively based on aesthetics, what we needed for structure, and what the contractor wanted for fabrication and erectability. And so when you look at that and you say, okay, well, there's the Pentagon, and that's how it fits. Now, you have to have a really good eye to be able to see in those spheres the Pentagons, to read the Pentagons. It's a little easier in the top image, but in the lower images, you have to have a really good eye. But some of the things that architects are dreaming of with some collaboration, you can actually make them uh, have some rational thought that makes it so that it's possible to prefabricate, preassemble, and make it within reason in terms of uh, cost and, and uh, the ability to build. So they'll be coming. They're going to be starting steel erection any, any day now, I think. And then you'll be seeing these coming up over the next few months. So next time you're downtown, take a look. I, I promise it will be a fascinating experience. And you all know the secret, Pentagons. <laughs> So we've covered these topics. You have all passed them. And so I'm happy to announce that you are now all eligible for your very own structural engineer stamp. Thank you.